Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Pretty good turnout. I have it streaming on my page, uh, Alberta Stronger, uh, right now. You know, if you can like and share, that'd be wonderful. That's probably the easy one. Anyway, like like Maureen, I mean, she's she said she's done a lot of stuff, and she wants to continue to continue do everything that she possibly can to help this movement, and so do I. Um, I've been at it for a long time, a couple of years anyway, it's not as long as some people, uh, Rob Manders, not to mention any names, um, but I, I mean, I, I, I ran for MLA last election, I, I beat the Liberal, all right? Yeah. 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 And then I, I got into uh, Wex in Alberta. I was the northern regional organizer. Um, we there's a few different ways to uh, form a party in Alberta. Uh, we opted to go with the signatures. You need uh, eight thousand four hundred and thirteen signatures in order to like for everyday Albertans just to to register a party in Alberta political, uh, provincial political party. And uh, I was well on my way to doing that. I had, oh, 350 people or so throughout the province getting signatures for me. <laughs> yeah, Bridget. <laughs> and uh, I arranged for a lot of businesses to have the, the signature sheets there so people could just come off the street to a business and get stuck inside, you know, and add their name to to the quota. Um, we were well on our way. I think we were close to 6,000 signatures, 8,413 uh, And then, throwing it. Well, that shut me down. Uh, shut us down. But, uh, thankfully, we, we, we started some talks with the uh, Freedom Conservative Party. Uh, they were a registered party, as already had their registration. And uh, the merger went through, we merged, and uh, now it's the Wild Rose Independence Party of Alberta. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, Paul Hinman couldn't be here. Um, he, he, would, he would like to be, but he couldn't be here, so that's, that is what it is in life, right? Um, anyway, I... Uh, I've done a lot. I mean, I, I've probably knocked on 20,000 doors in the last two years, easily. Um, probably put on 10,000 kilometers on my vehicle. You know, going talk, going all over Alberta, talking to people that were interested in, in starting constituency associations, right? And uh, I mean, that's going to be key moving forward. I mean, WIPA is poised. We have a few constituency associations going right now. We just registered two, I believe. One in Bonneville, and where was the other one? Drum Howard, I think. Drum Howard. Anyway, there's a few more going on, uh, ready to go. We plan on having all 87 going before the next election in 2023, and that'll, that'll make Jason Kenny go, huh? Who are these people, right? I guess they're for real. Well, you're damn right they are. Right? Um, I, don't know, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this TMX pipeline. Um, everybody thinks it's the, uh, the do all, the be all, it's the savior, it's, uh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make everything better. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not a hindrance by any means at, at all. I mean, as you know, there was a pipeline there in the first place. It was an eight inch, I believe. And they were just twinning it. That's what we're doing. It's a 24 inch. They're, they're, they're tripling it. Well, I've done a lot of work uh, at the refinery that, that's right next to the, um, the end, end point, the port, Westridge Terminal. I could see it from my job. I take pictures of it. It was crazy. They, were, they made the, the government of BC put a barrier around it because they had these 
crazy kayakers come in and you know, signs and you know, disrupting things, right? Um, so they, they made a barrier so they couldn't get there. Anyway, uh, you, know, you must have heard the, uh, there's been these big tankers going from the west coast all the way around Panama Canal back up to urban refining because Pipeline East got thumbs uh, down, right? And it's well, this Westridge terminal, the bad thing about it is the only tanker that, the only class of tankers that can reach it from open water are these Aftermax tankers, okay? They've been around since the 50s. They can hold 500 barrels of oil-ish per tanker. So, 500,000, sorry. And uh, so, they're, they're, they have limited capacity. I mean, they're, they're, there's these great big things now, they're called the ULC, ULLC, ELLC, ultra large, da, 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 big giant tankers at two million barrels, okay? Now, for instance, they have this, it's called LOOP, the acronym is LOOP. It's called the Louisiana Offshore Oil Port. It's about 20 miles off of uh, Louisiana. It can hold at any time three of these monstrosities. So, and I mean, and that's just off Louisiana, that's the Gulf Coast. Gulf Coast. Uh, they have a, a, a pipeline that goes to it that handles 100,000 barrels per hour. It's crazy. They can unload them and offload them like insane. So, about 30 to 40 percent of the heavy oil capacity of the states, uh, that means the big cokers like we have in, uh, you know, Syncrude and, and Suncor and some in Edmonton. Uh, they're, they're all based on, in Louisiana, on, on the Gulf, Port, you know, Gulf Coast. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of our oil goes there. And, of course, like, say, if, say if you were a Japanese businessman that was looking for 2 million barrels of oil, would you be phoning up Canada and saying, okay, we're going to, we need two, bill, 2 million barrels. So, you know, we'll have to send four of these Aftermax tankers and all the the fuel that goes with it. These other tankers are so large too, they, they only, it's, it's cheaper to, uh, to fill them up in the first place, they get a discount, right? So I mean, if you were this Japanese guy that wanted two million barrels of oil, would you be prone to talk to the States or talk to Canada? You'd probably go to the States, right? Um, so I mean, that's, that's the kind of things that we're up against here. Um, and it's just, it's a shame, I mean, we really, we got, what's his name, Legault is the Quebec Premier, right? And you know, he just said, no, we're not gonna have dirty Alberta oil coming through our province and all that. I mean, that's what we're up against. And it's, it's a dirty crying shame, it really is. Uh, yeah, anyway. I think that's about enough of that. That's what all I really got. Uh, I mean, these guys are going to be talking about all sorts of stuff and we wanna hear what they have to say. So we're gonna move on and uh, Next speaker is Mr. Brandon Hodell. I kind of took this guy under my, my wing a, a while back, and uh, he's uh, never looked back. Come on up, Brandon. Well, thank you all for being here. I'd uh, just like to thank Bridget and her husband for hosting this event so that we can all be here. So, because this is going to be going on social media and other people probably be viewing this, I wrote everything out so that we don't go on tangents and I can stay on point. So, I have to read off the paper. So, my name is Brandon Hodell. I have served Alberta as a paramedic for the past 12 years and I'm currently a volunteer for the Wild Rose Independence Party of Alberta. I am an Alberta separatist and a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta. I'm speaking today to talk about our independence because I believe Canada has fallen and I want to help save what little of it is left here at home. Trudeau and the Liberals have opened Pandora's box. Alberta has no control over Parliament or the Senate. The only thing we have control over is separation. 
Our economic survival depends on it more than ever now. We will always face the threat of another Liberal government and literally another Trudeau. People in Alberta need to pay close attention right now and do their own research. We need to have the popular support of all Albertans, which is why I've been focusing on public education, especially with our younger voters. We are being politically and economically oppressed by Ottawa, which can be evidenced by the following. Quebec and Ontario control 199 of the 330 seats in Parliament, so the election is safely decided by them before we even get a cast of vote. Laurentian Canada will never give us electoral reform, and they'll never treat us fairly. Our sovereignty under Section 9280 of the Constitution is being fringed upon to develop and export our energy resources, which can be evidenced by Bill C-48, the tanker bound of Canadian bitumen, Bill C-69, which has been dubbed the No More Pipelines Act, and the carbon tax, which has driven out over $60 billion in private foreign investment causes over 100,000 high paying jobs before the pandemic. I believe that because our province has no real say in Ottawa, I'd argue that we have taxation without representation, which in my opinion is theft. We are being treated like a colony that's being exploited. We are still giving Ottawa over $30 billion per year in the form of taxes and transfer payments, even though we now have one of the highest unemployment rates in Canada. We have given Canada over $650 billion in transfer payments alone since 1957, and yet they are still trying to destroy our economic powerhouse, which generates this wealth. For every point increase we have in unemployment in Alberta, we suffer 16 to 17 more suicides because of our economic crisis. As an independent nation with the third largest proven oil reserves on the planet and one of the largest supplies of clean natural gas, we have the potential to produce $150 billion a year in energy alone. Our gross domestic products per person could, get, could become the second highest in the world, making us the eighth wealthiest nation on the planet. <laughs> Let's make one thing perfectly clear. Canada does not subsidize Alberta at all. The only thing Canada gives us is a passport, which we can get ourselves. <laughs> Separation is not only possible, but it's legal. Oddly enough, Quebec laid the groundwork for us when they tried to separate from Canada. The Clarity Act makes it legal for any province to separate, however difficult. The Supreme Court of Canada has provided us with a clear path to succession, the easiest would involve the support of the United Nations Security Council, in part or in full, to recognize us as an independent nation and for successful with a democratic referendum on separation. This would also include the renegotiations of the international treaty rights of our First Nations community. We need to form a new nation of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Albertans. If we settle all of our First Nation claims, we win the votes of all 500 members of the UNSC because of the binding law of sovereignty. This pretty much means that if the President of the United States recognizes Alberta as an independent nation, then it's a done deal. A recent example of this is South Sudan, that was the last country to legally separate from the home nation back in 2011 under the UN oppression test for being culturally oppressed because they were being persecuted as Christians. Alberta meets the burden of proof for us being politically and economically oppressed. That's right. Despite popular belief, we will not be landlocked because of international treaties and agreements. We have the legal right to have access to Tidewater as an independent nation with UN Article 124 and 125, as well as being able to hold the Trans-Pacific Partnership hostage, which is worth over $28.5 trillion in trade to get our pipelines built. We can also turn off the taps for home heating to the rest of Canada. Even if we do not have these rights or any international law and treaties, we'd still be better off selling our products exclusively to the Americans because we get to keep our wealth at home here from the rest of Canada. My aim is to have a republic where we have an actual constitution that's people driven and written by the people. In my view, the rights of the indiv individual should supersede any interest of any future elected representative and or government. It's time to put the rights of the people before the interests of any future elected government. <laughs> now here is why I think, sorry one second, lost that page. Now here is why I think Canada is toast, and why Albertans should cut bait and run. 
The Liberals lost their AAA credit rating and were about to lose their AA credit rating. The federal debt is past one trillion. We now owe over four trillion dollars as a nation with a population of less than 36 million people. If you also add up all the provincial debts and the marketplace debt, not including the municipal debts. The Parliamentary Budget Committee is on public record forecasting a debt to GDP ratio to be 200% next year. The last time Canada was an honorary member of the Third World was back in the 1990s when this was only 66.6%. It's almost going to be four times as bad next year. Sure to save another Trudeau. Another Trudeau. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The last, yeah, I already read that. Uh, mm -hmm. The Liberals have been printing more money out of thin air for the COVID-19 relief spending, which is going to cause hyperinflation of the dollar. Newfoundland's about to default on their debt, and when they do, so will Ontario, because they bought most of Newfoundland's debt. And because no one in the world will buy these debt bonds, the government of Canada has been. The Liberals have also been propping up the economy with temporary jobs with more debt spending, which is eventually going to hit a wall. And the former CEO of Encana talked about this on BNM Bloomberg as well. We have nothing back in our currency anymore. Trudeau sold off all of our gold reserves and he destroyed the energy sector, which was the last thing back in our currency. None of our social programs are sustainable anymore. We are about to suffer a complete economic collapse. The cost of living and food prices will skyrocket. Taxes are going to go up so high that people will reach their breaking point. And record unemployment will soar as people in investment flee Canada. I think support for Alberta's independence will skyrocket by next year once enough people have suffered from our economic crisis. Because only through independence can we bring back economic prosperity and social stability, especially when we know the dollar will crash. I see Canada losing all of our international foreign investment if the Liberals and NDP are successful at passing their universal basic income, because honestly, who's going to pay for that? You and I. Well, I'm not willing to pay it. I am also 100% convinced that the Liberal government and NDP Party of Canada are trying to usher the country into socialism. We already have limits placed on our freedom of speech as well as a compelled speech law with Bill C-16. We already have state censorship of the mainstream media through funding and the Liberal government ho is hostile towards journalists who ask the tough questions. We already have gun prohibitions happening from law-abiding citizens like every single communist and fascist gov government before throughout human history. We already have the government shutting down the economy, putting business and people out of work so they can usher in their standardized living income, which in my opinion will allow them to centralize all goods and services, which is the essence of communism. And once you're dependent on the government for survival, taking away all your rights, your freedom, civil liberties becomes extremely easy. We also already have the Bank of Canada looking at phasing out cash and moving towards a digital currency. This means they can track every single dollar you make as well as track how, when, and where you spend your money. This is very alarming and everything stated can be verified and fact-checked. The Liberal government of Canada is forcing their political ideology onto those who don't want it. They are telling us how to live our lives, what to do, and how to do it with no accountability and using the pandemic as political cover. The Liberals and NDP suspended our parliament until September 21st before they prorogued it. And Canada, because of the pandemic, and Canada was the only G7 nation that actually shut down a democracy because of the virus. And we all know that when influenza season hits and the second wave of COVID-19 hits, that they will subvert our democracy again and again. The gun bans have nothing to do with public safety and everything to do with disempowering the lawful citizen. I was speaking with an elder from Treaty 8 First Nations a couple months ago, and he said that Trudeau cannot have their firearms and that he is now a separatist as well. He told me that it just doesn't make sense to be governed and to listen to a bunch of criminals who live so far away in Ottawa. Fun fact, many members of Treaty 8 First Nations are descendants of Louise Riel. They also don't call it the Northwest Territory Rebellion, they call it the Resistance. I was told that Treaty 8 First Nations will never bow to the Crown of Canada, and I don't plan to either. Thanks for listening. My name is Brandon Hodell, and I'm an Alberta separatist. I support Albertans first. So, 
Uh, up next, uh, we have uh, Rob Anders, a uh, former member of Parliament for Calgary West. You can also get a membership of the Wild Rules Independence Party. Uh, so well, mine's going to be a little more ad lib. Uh, it's impressive that he wrote that all down. Now, am I going to try to do both mics at the same time? Is that yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do what I can to try to service both my microphones. Well, folks, uh, I want to see Alberta as autonomous as it possibly can. And why do I say that? What are the reasons? Well, like Brandon said in his speech, I could be glib and say there's 650 billion reasons. And there are. It's true. Think about that. We paid the national debt. That's how much they've taken out of us. But I give you even just one reason, aside from 650 billion. If Alberta had control over our environmental policy, over our oil and gas policy. If we didn't have to bother with people telling us we've got to go through review after review after review, you know, when they've already approved pipelines and then said, no, we're going to second guess that, except for blah, blah, blah. Even if we just had that, never mind anything else, and I'll talk about the other issues. Even if we just had that, imagine how much better off we would be in terms of jobs and the economy. Now, I know my house, I've probably lost a third of the equity that I had in it a few years ago. Okay. And we all know the devastation that it's causing in terms of the jobs. You know, I, I go around, uh, I just picked up a beautiful set of furniture off of a family. Uh, they gave it away for free because they had lost a job in the family, they downsized, they couldn't fit anymore. They had little children in the house. You could tell the kids prized the stuff. It was off of MacArthur Fine Furniture. They prized it, beautiful stuff, heirloom stuff that would have stayed around for generations. But they couldn't actually keep it because of the space. You know, you know all these types of stories. So even if we just had control of our oil and gas and environmental policy, right? You know, this province fought for mineral rights. When you look back at Ernest Manning and a lot of the you know, the, the social credit, the United Farmers of Alberta, you look at all these things, these battles that went on between Alberta and Ottawa, Lougheed, Trudeau, etc. Even if we just had our own environmental policy, you know, we would be so much further ahead than where we are now. I want to also address <coughs> the tough questions, because these come up, and uh, I want to give them a shot because I think they're important. So people say, well, what would it look like? You know, there's a group of Albertans who invited the leader of this party provincially to go and speak in Edmonton. And there was a debate about whether or not he should go or not go. They were, they were called 51st staters. So they advocate for the idea that Alberta becomes the 51st state of the United States. And there were people who said, no, we shouldn't associate that, no, we shouldn't talk about that. But, but let, me, let me talk about what, is, what does independence look like? The first option in my mind is that we take every single right that Quebec has and then some. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Years ago, you know, when I first got elected as a Reform Party member from 1997, I often got mistaken for a Bloc Québécois MP. You say, know, why is that? Well, it's because my hair is brown and my skin is very pale and I have blue eyes and I often wore blue suits. And they, I would have people in the House of Commons, we call them the green guys, who went around the hill, you know, working as uh, staff, etc. They would start speaking to me en français, right? Start speaking to me in French, and I would say, uh, je ne pas pour si tu veux, you know, they would speak French. And they go, oh, okay, I know. Right? And they start talking to me in English, if they spoke English, because you're supposed to technically be bilingual, but a lot of them aren't. You know? uh, that's a, it's little, little, little things they get around to make sure they get the, the cushy jobs in Ottawa. But anyhow, uh, I had so many block MPs who used to say to me, We've got our own pensions. We've got our own tax collection. We've got our own this. We've got our own that. What the hell is wrong with you? Why haven't you 
guys already done this. And you know what? They were exactly right. They were exactly right. Why the hell haven't we done these things? You know, when, when you look at the pension system, I'm going to tell you a story. I remember when the you know, contribution rates were going to go from 5% up to 5.5 to 9.9. And Martin realized as a finance minister that it was a big problem. It was a Ponzi scheme. They didn't have enough money to finance this. So they needed to get 7 out of 10 provinces to agree to it. Well, Quebec already had their own pension. Okay. And Mike Harris, God bless him, as a real right winger, said, no, I don't want to go along with this. All we needed was Ralph Klein. All we needed was Ralph. And it, and it wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't have gone from 5.5 contribution rate up to 9.9. .9. So I remember I and Diane Blonsi, on behalf of the Reform Party, we reached out to Ralph and some of his ministers and we said, kibosh this, just say no. But at that point in time, I, I don't know why, Ralph wasn't getting along with Preston Manning, they weren't seeing eye to eye, whatever was going on. And he decided to go along with it. And so our contribution rates went from 5.5 to 9.9. And it's still a massively unfunded liability. It's still a Ponzi scheme. You know, Scott Reed, who was our researcher at the time, his family owned Giant Tiger, very successful, one of the smartest guys in Parliament. He represents an area just outside of Ottawa, the Ottawa Valley. He had a brilliant idea, individualized accounts. It was based on the Chicago School of Economics. It was basically what Milton Friedman advocated for Chile. Okay? And Augusto Pinochet and Chile implemented it. And the idea is this. Let's say it doesn't matter whether you're janitor or you're president, 3% of your salary goes into an individualized account. Now maybe you get a business or a government, whatever, school board, whatever it happens to be, that matches it. You say, we'll match it another 3%. Okay? So you get 6% of your salary, right, saved up in this thing. The beautiful thing about it is if you go down the street in Santiago in Chile, and I knock the door, and I ask somebody, and you're smart people, I know that. You wouldn't be gathered here in a backyard to listen to political speeches and independence if you didn't have financial wherewithal. I know that. But if I put the question to you, like I would put the question to going door to door in Santiago, and I said, how much did you put into the CPP this past year? How much in aggregate over your lifetime have you contributed to the CPP? What has been your return on investment over this last year and over your lifetime in the CPP? You're smart people. I couldn't tell you because, well, it's pathetic. It's a Ponzi scheme. But if you did that in Santiago, they would be able to tell you. That's the beauty of individualized accounts. Now, Scott Reed went one step further. Okay? We have this thing. It used to be called EI. Now it's you know, UI, EI. You know, what, what he said was, okay, let's take another 3%. Okay, so you get three percent for your CPP, for your individualized accounts. You take three percent for your EI, employment insurance. Okay, and maybe your employer matches it up. Six percent, six about twelve percent. We're talking real money here, right? Especially compounded over your lifetime. Now he said, if you go ahead and you lose your job or you quit your job, you want to go to school, get some more retraining, go and get a master's degree, whatever it is. Okay, you decide you want to buy a first house because you don't have that. Okay, you know, these types of essentials, etc. He says you can take it out of that. Now, if you're like my father, God bless him, okay, who never drew a day's unemployment in his life, and it was never late, it was never late for work in his whole life either. Impressive. Okay, he would have 12% invested over his entire lifetime. Wow, right? Chile is the most stable, solid financial situation in all of. Central and Southern America, okay, because of Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economics. Can you imagine if Alberta had done that for the last 20, 30 years? Now just think of what we should be doing going forward. Of course it makes sense. And some people are going to say to you, oh, but what about our CMP pensions? What about MP pensions? What about park warden pensions? Do not kid yourselves. Canada, when he talked about the trillion dollars in debt, is in, in no stretch of the imagination a better financial circumstance to provide for those pensions than the province of Alberta or than the territory of Alberta is. Of course you're in better financial shape. If you have to, if you have to trust people to look after a public pension, right, would you rather trust the people in Edmonton or the people in Ottawa? It's obvious. Okay? You just ask the bankers. Okay? Ask the bankers. They'll tell you. <laughs> All right.
So the first option, like I said, is for Alberta to get every single power that Quebec has and then some. Okay. And then they can say, well, you know what? I don't think it's enough. Mm -hmm. Because for whatever reason, you think the taxes are too high or whatever, you don't like what the federal government's up to, which is entirely legitimate. Then, you know, when you look at the American situation, and this is, I'm speaking to these people who are in favor of the 51st state option. The last two states to join, okay, the 49th and the 50th state, Alberta, sorry, Alaska and Hawaii, okay, it was in 1959. In both their cases, they had to be protectorates of the United States for over 60 years before they were admitted. And it was done because the delicate balance of power in the U.S. Senate was such that the Republicans wanted a couple seats, the Democrats wanted a couple seats, you had to have the counterbalance against each other, so they realized Alaska was going to bring in two, Hawaii was going to bring in two for the Democrats, it was going to be an even season. Okay? In the case of Alberta, you would probably be voting Republican. Okay? So, you know, then the Democrats would say, well, what do we get? Do we get, you know, District of Columbia? Do we get Puerto Rico, etc.? It's a complicated thing, and frankly, it's not up to us. It's up to the U.S. Congress, right? So it's complicated. And like I said, in those scenarios, it took over 60 years for it to happen. However, what is a more practical solution, okay, if you decided, I don't want to pay federal tax anymore, I don't like it, and I don't blame you, okay? You paid $650 billion into Ottawa, you, you're, you've overpaid by a long stretch for a generation, if not more. And you said, okay, I want to be a protectorate of the United States, like a Puerto Rico, like the American Virgin Islands, like Cuba was, like the Philippines was. The great thing about it is, you can be a protectorate, you can also choose not to be a protectorate, you can leave again, as was the case with Panama, Cuba, the Philippines. And they paid no tax federally. The only people who paid federal tax were those people who actually were employed by the federal government. So imagine that, no federal income tax. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Right? That's pretty good. You know, I remember back in the golden days when Ralph Klein was, was premier of this province, and we had Richard Magnus as an MLA who was advocating to say that we should get rid of income tax. We had enough oil royalties rolling in at the time that we could have actually got rid of income tax. Can you imagine a scenario where you wouldn't pay any federal income tax and then you could actually get rid of income tax provision? or in, in, in Alberta sense? Wow. Just imagine the savings. Imagine what would be left in your pockets and the productive energy of people in Alberta, what, what you could do, right? What, what a sucking sound that would be from not only the rest of Canada, but the rest of North America, possibly even the world. How many people do you think would want to move here so that they could benefit from that type of tax structure, right? Yeah. Phenomenal. Okay, let's talk about the third option. The third option is what I call Switzerland with oil and gas. Okay, the Swiss, Swiss at the West. time of the Second World War had about four million population, about what Alberta has. Okay, and if you think that they faced foreign threats, you bet you, yeah, you bet you they did. <laughs> they had the they had the German foreign minister say, what would the Swiss do? if we took a million German soldiers and put them on the Swiss frontier. And he went ahead, he took a quick shot of schnapps, and he said, we would have to all take two shots and then go home. Because the Swiss had a militia that at that time was from 18 to I think 54, now it's down to around 30, but they raised 800,000 people as a militia during the Second World War so that they could remain independent. And that means that about one weekend a month, you'd have to go ahead and do some target practice, right? And that means you're all pretty good shots. You all qualify well in the Schutzen Fest, the annual Schutzen Fest. Right there. Okay? And uh, it, that's what's guaranteed Swiss independence for 800 years, despite Napoleon, despite Adolf Hitler, okay? Pretty impressive record. So these are the types of options that we're looking at. Sometimes people say, well, what would Alberta do for a currency? Right? Well, under the first scenario, you still use a Canadian dollar. Now, we all know it, it's getting worth less and less with Justin Trudeau at the helm. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's a great deal, but whatever. Okay? 
The other one is you can use a U.S. dollar. And you can use a U.S. dollar whether or not they want you to or not, because there's other jurisdictions in the Caribbean, okay, that use the U.S. dollar, the Bahamas, etc. You can use the U.S. dollar. There's nothing blocking you from doing that, okay? Or if you were Switzerland with oil and gas, you could use a gold-backed currency, like the Swiss do, okay? There's options. And frankly, I think an Alberta-run option on this is far better than an Ottawa-run option on this. But anyhow. I want to talk about, because he mentioned this with regard to, say, for example, you know, we have a number of reserves and other tribes here in the province of Alberta and in Western Canada. And those people may say to themselves, okay, well, you know, we know what we've got as a deal from Ottawa. We know how that's going. Mm -hmm. How can this look different for us going forward? Uh, I think that if you went to a lot of folks, Métis or Full Blood, and you said, how do you feel about property rights? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about real gun rights? They want to right? own their own land. Yeah. You own, you own your own land. You have a deed to it. It's, you know, it's, 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 not, a, it's not a figment of the, of the federal government, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and I, I know, for example, you know, that uh, a lot of those folks are very concerned about what's going on with this 1,500 firearms classifications that Trudeau's looking to come down and clamp down on. He's basically taking a page out of this very progressive prime minister in New Zealand uh, in terms of a gun grab, right? Um, I think a lot of those folks would say, yeah, you know what? We've, you know, give, give us property rights, let us have our guns, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Don't meddle with our affairs. I remember I was the first member of parliament. Uh, I was approached by Rob Clark, who was one of our MPs in Northern Saskatchewan. And he came to me and, you know, when you run a private member's bill in Ottawa, you have to get other MPs to kind of sign on to it to hopefully get it up the voting roster in the House of Commons. And he came to me and he said, Robbie, I, I want to ask you a favor. He says, if you sign this, some of the other guys might have the guts to sign it. He says, but if I go to them first, they probably won't do it. He said, I want to get rid of the Indian Act. And I said, give it to me. So I signed it. And we, we got a number of MPs, dozens to sign it type of thing. We didn't get it accomplished. I know that Kretzian, when he was prime minister, thought about it because when he was a minister way back when under Trudeau, he didn't like aspects of it type of thing. And so when he was prime minister, he approached the Liberal cabinet and said, let's scrap this thing. And uh, they didn't have the guts to do it because they thought it would be too controversial. But you know, the, the, I think these are real tangible things that we can offer to maybe Métis and Full Blood uh, people uh, in Alberta to say, you know, there's, there's a better way to go about this. Now, I want to tell just a couple other stories about my time in Ottawa, because I think it's going to illustrate for you the frustration and the problems we face. When I was first elected as a reform MP, uh, I was a deputy to Dale Johnson, one of our Alberta members of Parliament. And there were departmental officials who testified before us in our committee that they weren't going to need a hundred million dollars worth of spending in the envelope. So when the presentations were done and it was time for us to make amendments and move motions, we moved a motion saying that the departmental estimates would be reduced by a hundred million dollars based on what their own officials said. And Ridge Alcock, who was the president of the Treasury Board for the Liberals, voted us down and said, there's a difference between not using the money, or is there, there's a difference between not needing the money and not using the money. Just because they didn't say they were going to need the money doesn't mean they wouldn't use the money. So they left in the $100 million and it was voted and gone in March Madness just like that. Right? One little teeny weeny example on one committee. Right? But this goes on all the time in Ottawa. I remember when I was on the National Defense and Veterans Affairs Committee, you've all probably heard of EH-101 helicopters, the ones that are rust buckets that fall out of the sky where the metal fatigue is extreme, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we were debating whether or not we were gonna get replacements. And what these helicopters do, okay, they either perform search and rescue to some extent, okay, or they are used to go off the back of a Canadian frigate that has a very long extension, a sonar cable that goes behind it so it can hear, listen for Russian 
or Chinese submarines, etc. Okay, and then you take these EH-101 helicopters and you travel out from the ship and you drop sonar buoys in the water so that you can better hear the acoustics what's going on. Okay, that's the purpose. So, because I was on National Defense and Veterans Affairs, I knew all about the search and rescue capabilities, how many people it could take, poundage. I knew about how far it could fly away from a ship, etc. Sonar buoys, capacity, etc. One of the options that was being considered was Eurocopter. So they graciously came to Ottawa. They went out to the Ottawa airport. We could drive out to the Ottawa airport, and I, my staff, other MPs, could get on the Eurocopters, and they flew us around Parliament Hill and gave us a tour and told us all about the specs. Now, I was a relatively young man. Okay, I was nominated at 24, elected at 25, so I was a very young looking fellow. And I was asking all these questions from the Eurocopter executives who were up. And he just turned to me and he said, listen, kid, it's all about jobs in Quebec. This thing's going to produce jobs in Quebec. That's all you need to know. And then just kind of ignored me. It didn't matter about what the search and rescue capabilities were. Didn't matter what it was doing with regard to the Russian and the Chinese submarines, okay, and our NATO obligations. No, it was jobs in Quebec. So many stories. I remember one time in Alberta caucus, we, we would have Alberta caucus meetings was on Wednesday morning. A national caucus meeting was after that between 10 and noon. But the Alberta caucus meetings would happen at 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. And I remember one time, Chris Warkington, member of parliament, still, still an MP, said, I don't like these advertisements that come up from the Prime Minister's office with my name on it, ascribing quotes to me, talking about how I enjoy or endorse the pissing away of taxpayer money on this, 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 and this. I know you're going to give the money away. I know that people are going to apply for it, and I know you're going to give some of it out. But he said, my people, our members, our supporters, my voters in my riding hate this. And he said, and you ascribe quotes to me talking about how good it is. He said, I know you're going to hand it out anyhow. He said, but just leave me the hell out of the press release. He says, because if my people see it and they read the quotes that you've got in there, I'm going to catch it for that. Because I didn't say it, they don't believe it. And they're going to be angry with me. So stop it. So we had this big discussion in the Alberta caucus. And we determined that we hated Western Diversification Initiative. And we didn't want to see any more money given out. We didn't want to steal from Peter to pay Paul. We wanted it ended. And so Ron Ambrose, who was our regional minister at the time, took it as a motion from the Alberta caucus, went to the national caucus at 10 a.m., and when it came time for the 30-second intervals for MPs to stand up in front of the microphone and talk to the head table, said to the prime minister and the head table that we wanted to end Western Diversification Initiative and wanted all the monies to stop and wanted to kibosh and that said it was over and dead and done. And I won't say who, but an MP from the East stood up immediately after she said it and said, that's wonderful. Oh my gosh, we'll take it all. We would love to spend that money. If you guys don't want to give out those checks, we would be honored to give out those checks. We love giving away checks. That's what it's all about. We get votes with those checks. Absolutely, please, please, please. If you don't want to spend the money, we'll take it all, we'll spend it all, we'll take all the credit for it. And those of us in the Alberta caucus, and not just the Alberta caucus, the BC caucus, the Saskatchewan caucus, the Manitoba caucus, just kind of hung our heads in shame, thinking, wow, Right? We tried to save taxpayer money. We thought it was a waste. We didn't agree with it. But here we got other people inside the caucus are no, 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 no. I want my name big and bright on that check and I'll pose with a picture and a smile. Okay? Different mentality about how the country should be governed. We had a guy here in Alberta. His name was Mike Nickerson. He went down on a trip to Texas and like any good redneck, he saw this big stretch pickup truck. Not a limo, a pickup truck. And he thought, wow, that's something that could go down. Remember the good old days when Calgary had money to throw around and there was oil patch stuff and you know, all that. You remember those good old days? 2007. You remember that? A long time ago now, eh? Anyhow, he thought that'd be a great idea. I think people up here would support it. So he went ahead and he got this pickup truck and he took it down and he got it stretched and Alberta Motor Vehicles was like, yep, no problem. Sure, you go ahead for it, Mike, set the blah, blah, blah. But then, along came this guy from Transport Canada. 
And he said, no, no, Transport Canada hasn't authorized this. He said, well, I, I, you know, I've, I've got all the stuff that I need from Alberta Motor Vehicles. It's, it's insured, it's registered, it's good to go. What the hell's the problem? And they said, no, 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 but this hasn't been crashed and this hasn't been burned to determine whether or not it's roadworthy. He said, it's a pickup truck. What do you want? And so they seized it. And he had to go through a court battle that cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars that nearly bankrupted him to be able to get it back. We had to make a media issue of this in order for the federal government to release the truck back. Right? I, I could tell stories all night long about how Ottawa has done bad things to business opportunities here in Alberta. And so I guess what I leave you with is this. Do we have idiots in the province of Alberta, like Rachel Notley, etc., blah, 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 and the people who voted for her? You bet you do. You bet you do. Yeah, 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 we do. We do. But, but, you're far better off to have subsidiarity, to have devolution, to have government closer rather than further away, and to be governed by Edmonton rather than Ottawa. My whole life in politics has told me that is the case. I believed it before I went to Ottawa. It was etched in my bones being out there for 18 years, okay? So that's why I believe Alberta should be as autonomous as it possibly can be. That's why I support Paul Hinman, who said two wonderful examples of being able to steal seats away from the establishment down in southern Alberta, which is the, the, the heart of conservatism in this country. Okay, for the United Farmers of Alberta, for social credit, for Wild Rose, for the Reform Party. God bless Paul, I hope he does it again. All right, and uh, I think we should, as much as possible, govern our own destinies going forward, we'll be better off for it. God bless you and thank you for attending. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Beasley. gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for taking time out on a Saturday to come and speak about these passionate issues that, that we all are near and dear to our hearts. Um, ladies and gentlemen online who are paying attention, if you could uh, do us a favor and make sure that you share and like this presentation. Uh, it's really the important for us to be able to share this as widely as we can to, to build the understanding of what we're trying to do and when it's all said and done to raise the profile of the Wild Rose Independence Party. On behalf of Mr. Hinman, on behalf of Danny Hozak, I, I say hi to all of you folks. Um, I've had the, the great honor of being able to uh, go around some places around the province and listen to Mr. Hinman speak and Mr. Hozak. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I without any reservation at all, uh, Paul Hinman is three times the gentleman that Jason Kenney ever thought of being. Uh, Paul Hinman would look us in the eye and he would tell us something and he wouldn't be there to sugarcoat it. Mr. Hinman would not be someone who would be there to say what he thinks we want to hear to get a vote uh, to scam us when it's all said and done. And, and he would fight for Alberta first, for Canada second. He wouldn't get elected and suddenly profess to be, I'm a, I'm a Canadian Federalist. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Canadian first and an Alberta second. As far as I'm concerned, ladies and gentlemen, the leadership that Mr. Hinman is showing is exactly the leadership that this province needs right now and we've got to fight for it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Jason Kenney is a carpetbagger. He's coming to this province. We've all heard him. We all heard the promises on the campaign trail, and I don't know many of his promises that he's made, that he's kept. He's gone ahead and put us into such ridiculous debt. Do we all remember him on Danielle Smith's radio station talking about how uh, the NDP were supporting wind and solar, and his first quip was, we don't have money for that, we're broke. Well, all of a sudden, Jason Kenney is putting $30 billion of debt onto the taxpayers of this province at a time when we can least afford it. I could go on and on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, what it comes down to is this. I'm going to ask you for a quick show of hands. How many of you out there right now, and those of you online, you can quietly raise your hand by yourself uh, as you're sitting around your camera. How many of you know people that are in dire straits? How many of you know people that have lost hope that have lost their downtrodden, that they've lost hope, they've lost opportunity, they're worried about their family, they're worried about their mortgage, if they haven't already lost it. 
Boy, I mean, if I had a dozen hands, they'd all be going up right now. That's who we speak for. We speak for the downtrodden. We fight for the downtrodden. We realize that a good, significant portion of what we're living through right now is absolutely artificial. We may be of living through six, seven months of, of a COVID epidemic. We can argue whether it's real or not. I think some people will say that it's not. Other people will say that it is. But what I know is this, that over the last five years, the economic oppression that we live with in our society, this downturn that we've seen has nothing to do with market forces. This is Eastern MPs, primarily from, Man or from Ontario and Quebec, that have a feeling that somehow global warming is something that Canada should do something about. And they're going ahead and using their votes to oppress our primary industries, our way of life. Why? Because we can't do a darn thing about it right now. They are, this isn't the first time this has happened, ladies and gentlemen. You can see I got a bunch of gray hair up here. I'm 59 years old in about a week and a half. And I remember back, my earliest political memories go back to the late 1960s. I remember the day when Justin Trudeau's father was elected. I remember the day when Peter Lougheed was elected. I remember what Eastern Canada did to the West in the National Energy Program of the 1980s. This movie we're watching right now has been going on for generations. We have to ask ourselves on behalf of the poor and the downtrodden an opportunity that we're a heartbeat away from losing. Are we prepared to continue to accept this? Are we going to fight? Are we going to do something about it? I look at these beautiful children over here that are in the audience today, and I know that there's grandparents here, I know that there's moms and dads here, and it's for those that we need to fight. That opportunity that we took for granted is a heartbeat away from being lost, and it will be lost forever. The biggest problem that we've got in our society right now, quite frankly, is apathy. I'm so proud of you folks for getting up on a, on a Saturday afternoon where it's all overcast like this and the people that are tuning in online because it's obvious you care. But the people that aren't paying attention to this, they need to understand that our future is on the line. Rob made a great comment about values and home values in this province. There's one example of dozens. Each and every one of our homes, if you're fortunate enough to own one, is down well over $100,000. Again, not because of market forces, but because of political interference in our economy. I reject that. I reject the fact that we could be, as Brendan says, the eighth largest economy in the world. And that is by the Alberta Treasury Branch analysis. These aren't numbers that our movement is, is pulling out of the air. These are real numbers. But all we need to do is to have the courage to go ahead and fight for what's rightfully ours. We have to stand up and say, enough's enough. We have to mobilize our society to the point where those that are complacent to sit home on a Sunday afternoon drinking their beer, and I'm not going to pay attention to politics until the next election cycle. Because you know what? Right now, I just feel like sipping on my beer. And you know, I, I, I'm kind of comfortable. I've got some wings in the fridge, and, and well, I'll, I'll just live with this. You need to get, I'm talking to those types, you need to get off your behind, and you need to realize just how important this is, and how within less than five years, this could be lost forever. I reject that. I'm not willing to accept that on behalf of myself. I'm not willing to accept that on behalf of my fellow Albertans. And as, as you heard earlier uh, from Maureen, my family's been in this province for 100 years. I've seen good times, I've seen bad times. And when it's bad times, when it's market forces, we can accept that. When it's our supposed brothers and sisters in Canadian Confederation voting without a single consideration as to the consequences of that vote, because they somehow feel like, oh, we've got to do something environmentally, so to hell with Alberta. Well, I'm going to remind everybody that, that has that mindset both the Prime Minister of this country and the Deputy Prime Minister have, act, have made public statements that if we shut Canada down, all of our industry, everything, it would not move the dial environmentally. This carbon tax that we're about to have uh, reimposed on us on the 23rd of this month, they've admitted it accomplishes nothing for the environment. All it does is undermine the West's economy. And ladies and gentlemen, Brendan touched on this a little earlier, and I'm just going to give you some statistics that I think might be a little, little shocking for you. Because I'm going to go and I'm going to make a little bit more of an emphasis on it. Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes have 200...
231 federal seats. 231 people that they elect that goes to Ottawa and represents them and they have their opportunity in the House of Commons in our democracy to say yay or nay to something. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, British Columbia, and the territories, all of them, 107 seats. 107 seats against 231 in the East. Is that acceptable to you? No. no. I've had enough, folks. I've had my fill. I'm so darn proud of Paul Hinman getting up and fighting for Alberta. And when it comes down to it, this movement, it must build. We must have a significant number of, of the MLAs that we're going to run in the next election. And quite frankly, the UCP's got some soul searching to do. They've elected a carpetbagger. They've elected somebody that's come into this province that looked all of us in the eye and made promises. And the minute he's elected, well, you know, it's not convenient for me to go forward with those promises. Remember grassroots guarantee, ladies and gentlemen? Remember? The minute he's elected, that's out the window. That was supposed to be a grassroots movement that he was committed to. Remember, we're going to get rid of the carbon tax, ladies and gentlemen? Remember the great fanfare on, on the, the election trail? Well, yep. you know what the son of a gun did? He got rid of the carbon tax for you and me, but you know where, what he did? Is he kept the carbon tax for the most important thing in this province, which is our heavy industry. Our heavy industry that invests in our societies, that gives people jobs, that invests in communities and municipalities. As a direct result of Jason Kenney not following through with his biggest pro promise, which is that he would take on all of our enemies, foreign and domestic, how do you think he's doing taking on Justin Trudeau? Is he doing anything on our behalf? Oh, he, he'll, he'll write another sternly written letter. Oh, yeah. oh boy, oh boy, he'll, he'll go hat in hand like he's out in Ottawa right now. <coughs> he's prepared to go hat in hand and he might not get a meeting with the Prime Minister. If I was Jason Kenney, if I was the Premier of this province, here's my words to Justin Trudeau. You either approve these pipelines within the next 90 days, they are clearly in the nation's best interests, and you either approve them, or I am stepping down as leader of Alberta and I am leading the separation movement against you and against Canada. You think that would get some attention, be. ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. You think that would be a lot more effective than a written letter? Yeah. He's yeah. not going to do shit. Jason Kenney's nothing but a liar. He promised, and all he did was he lied to each and every one of us. I say this. When I go out and I share the stage with Paul Hinman, I listen like I've never listened to anybody in my life. And I watch his body mannerisms, and I watch how he conducts himself. I watch how he answers questions. I know his background. He's not going to lie to the people of Alberta. I tell you what, Paul Hinman should be our leader. Because Paul Hinman would put Alberta first instead of Alberta second and Canada first. Paul mm -hmm. Hinman would absolutely fight for us, and he would fight like nobody's business. That's what we need right now. On behalf of all of those people that you raised your hands with and, and were in your mind when you raised your hands, those are the people that we need to fight for. I'm down in Brooks Medicine Hatch is where I'm out of. I've got a home down there. And I don't know whether you saw this on the news or not, but I, I just, I, I, I'm tearing up as I, as I mention this. They've had seven suicides in Medicine Hatch over, over the last very short while. These are, these are young families. These are young 40-year-olds that have got young children. They're, they're beautiful families. That, they've got everything in front of them. And I can't imagine the pain that those men would be going through to think that that's their only way out. We've got to, as a movement and as a province, we've got to fight for our prosperity. We have to say we're not going to accept this one moment longer. And at the end of the day, we're going to do what's necessary. Now, I support both the, the Wexit Canada, now I guess they call themselves the Maverick Party, and I support the uh, 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 Paul in, in the West Wild Rose Independence Party. And, and when I make that statement, and I think we can all agree with this, it's supporting the movement. You know, it's, it's not the fact that, that um, I support one over the other. I support them both. Because we need MPs in Ottawa that are going to stand up and say, mm -hmm. when there's some legislation being brought forward, Wait a minute. 
and, they, and they're going to speak, and they're going to speak loudly, and they're going to make sure that they're heard. At the end of the day, we need that in Alberta. One of the best things that I've heard Danny Ozak say in the speeches that I've made is, is that, you know, we've got to do our best to change some of these MLA's minds. They've got to realize that Kenny is, is a problem, and they they internally need to push a leadership review to make sure that we get the right guy in here that's going to follow through on his promises, not be yet another smooth-talking professional politician. Have you ever heard anybody more smooth than Jason Kenny? Oh, he's got that Morgan Freeman voice, and he can stand in front of a crowd, and people are mesmerized. He could do this, and everybody in the crowd, their heads are going to follow him, because he's a really good speaker. But guess what? So is Adolf Hitler. And I'm not comparing Jason Kenny to Adolf Hitler. I'm pointing out the value and the importance of public speaking and how that can mesmerize a crowd to the wrong conclusion. And that's exactly what Albertans have done, is we have picked the wrong leader. We need someone who will fight for Alberta first and Canada second. I don't want to be a, a separatist. I, 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 my lifetime, as I told you, my memories go back to the 60s, and, and a lifetime of a dysfunctional Canada, a lifetime of, of the name Trudeau, if it wasn't Justin Trudeau, it would be just another character from, from the East because of those 231 votes that could give a shit about, about us out here in the West. But at the end of the day, I've had a lifetime of a dysfunctional Canada. And I'm not prepared to leave this to another generation. Neither should any of you. Neither should any of you online that are paying attention to this speech. We've got to fight, and we've got to fight hard. And we've got to realize that this is an existential threat to our way of life, and we're a heartbeat away from losing it forever. We've got to run a full slate in the next election in Manitoba West. I'm going to talk about Aaron O'Toole for a second. Liberal <laughs> I, 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 I supported him. I was beguiled. I supported Kenny. You know, I, I ran against him as an independent, but I supported him because, you know, I took him at face value that everything he promised that I assumed he was going to do it, but the minute I found out I was being lied to, all of, I'm horrified, and you know what? Game on, buddy. I'm gonna, I intend to accept every speaking invitation that I can traveling this province and hopefully educating as many people as we can to have them realize. I think given his poll numbers right now, I think Albertans are on I think they're realizing, yeah, absolutely. Mr. O'Toole for a second. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll, I'll make this statement. A vote for the Conservative Party of Canada is a, a Western vote for the Conservative Party of Canada is a wasted vote and it's a wasted opportunity. Period. Full stop. When I talk when I talk about my, my political memories going back to the 60s, Rob, you remember Rob Stansfield? Yeah. You, you, yeah. So he was a, a, the conservative leader of, of the, cons, or the, the federal leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, and he used to have some epic battles with Trudeau Sr. way back when. The West has voted in every election, virtually in mass. We've had a few liberal MPs that have come out of Saskatchewan and some out of Edmonton, but for the most part, 95 to 98 percent of the MPs that the West, Manitoba, Ontario, Border West, have sent to Ottawa have all been conservative MPs. They've never done jack shit for our society. Aaron O'Toole, I'm so damn disappointed in him. Within a week and a half of him winning the leadership, what is he doing? He's pandering to Quebec. He's pandering that somehow Quebec is special and he supports those aspirations. What's the second thing that Aaron O'Toole did? He stands up and he says, I support Paris. Therefore, he supports the carbon tax. He supports economic oppression of the West, knowing full well that even a socialist liberal MP and his deputy minister have already said it accomplishes nothing but causes us economic harm. I recently testified to Parliament to the Standing Committee on our international trade relationship with the Americans. So these, these are very formal events. It was a, a great honor for me to go there. I've done it a couple of times. But as I'm sitting there testifying, I'm talking about technology that would eliminate the need for carbon tax that can provide enormous uh, adding value, if you will, to maybe some of our emissions. They weren't interested in listening to that story. I had a block MP look at me 
This is on the what's referred to as the blue, blue sheets, so it's the permanent record of Parliament. I had a block MP look at me and he said, well, does this mean that you don't support Paris? You don't support the carbon tax? And, and I looked him in the eye, and I, you know, there's probably 50 people in the room, and I said, our largest trading partners, the most important economy on the world, in the world, has no intentions of adopting punitive taxation. Why would we do it? Knowing that it, it isn't going to accomplish anything. Your leadership has already admitted it accomplishes nothing. Why would we hobble our society? Why would we destroy our economy? Why would we harm families, municipalities, and entire regions of this country? He had nothing to say. At the end of the day, there's no common sense in Ottawa. You think that common sense would be common? It has got nothing to do with it in Ottawa. This is all politics, this is all Quebec, this is, and it's always been always Quebec. You know, Justin Trudeau justified his law breaking with SNC Lavalin, and that's just one of a, a Mount Everest size pile of corruption coming out of liberals, in particular Quebec. He stood up and he says, well, I, I'm supporting Quebec jobs and I'm not going to apologize for that. He broke the law, he made us international laughing stock. At the end of the day, for 1,500 Quebec jobs, that was his justification for breaking the law and for supporting what I consider a criminal engineering enterprise in the form of SNC Lab. This isn't the first time they've done this. Meanwhile, the West has lost 175,000 direct jobs one in three restaurants is about to go under. Every time I turn around, there's another major multinational saying, we aren't coming here because the political environment is not stable, number one. And number two, we can't absolutely bank on the rule of law because every time we turn around, we've got a liberal socialist government that decides to change the rules halfway through an approval process. Folks, enough's enough. I've had my absolute fill. When, when they have that amount of imbalance in terms of our ability to say yes or no for a particular course of action, on behalf of that little guy right there, on behalf of those that come next, we have to say to ourselves, are we going to accept this? Are we going to do something about it? I'm not prepared to sit back and not do anything about it. And everybody that's paying attention, I would thank you. The East versus the West. Remember John Cretchen? There's a story I love to tell, and every time I make a speech, I'll, I'll tell this one just because it really points to what their feelings are towards us. So John Cretchen is on the campaign trail. I think he's going for his third term. Might have been his second term. And he stands up in front of a national microphone, and he says these words. <laughs> I prefer not to deal with them there people, eh? You know what he was talking about? You and me. He was talking about Manitoba West. Why? Because we don't matter when it's all said and done. From here? From this camera. Why would he keep going? So, yeah. You know, the, the economic analysis of what we could become, I, I want you to leave, if you leave with anything tonight, we could be the eighth largest economy in the world by saying no. People are concerned about their pensions or, or our military or, or all of our obligations. We would have billions of dollars to invest into our society. We would be able to give those that don't have hope, we would give them hope. And I believe if we have a just society, we would build that just society. What it comes down to is, is my separation or my divorce from Canada, if you will, it's not just Alberta I'm talking about. If we go, I'm pretty positive that, that our brothers and sisters next door in Saskatchewan, they're going to come with us. And I'm pretty sure that there's some mechanisms that we can put in place that we would actually entice Manitoba. Rob, I, I thought your words were just bang on in terms of our First Nations, because a lot of people put the First Nations issue as, as a major roadblock. Well, the, the First Nations are never going to agree to this. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to break it to those that would say that, 
They didn't want to be part of Canada in the first place. That's the reason they called it the Real Rebellion. And at the end of the day, we bo I, I believe in the Queen, I believe in the monarchy. Certainly Eastern Canada doesn't. That's a personal opinion, that's a personal choice. But the fact of the matter is, is that they may give deal with the monarchy. And I'm willing to bet that as Albertans, and as, as dedicated to fair trade, fair responsibility, and equality, that we would be very, very happy to accept First Nations. Uh, whatever obligations that were made to them, we would accept every one of those obligations. And moreover, under a wealthier society, we would have the ability to help raise up our First Nations, raise up our society, and give hope to all when it's all said and done. Uh, Aaron O'Toole, can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if we were to mobilize the federal arm of this discussion, and if every MP that's currently a conservative MP west of Manitoba, Ontario border, can you imagine if they were Maverick or wild, formerly Wild Rose Canada? Can you imagine the power that we would have? We could very well become, in one election cycle, the balance of power in this country. Some people say that we can't do that because the votes aren't right, but you know what? Quebec splits their vote with Bloc and with Liberal and with NDP. Just like the Liberal candidates in Lower Mainland Vancouver have got the hammer in Canada right now. What is there? Maybe a half a dozen seats? Rod, you probably know more about this than me. At the end of the day, could you imagine what our Western MPs, if they had that authority and that, and that wherewithal to actually influence where we're going with, uh, with Canadian Confederation. Um, I, I believe fundamentally that we have much to look forward to, that this movement is just, it's righteous, we need to build it, we need to overcome apathy, and what we need to do is we need to go into every community in this province, in the West, and we need to speak from the heart, and to have them understand that this is no longer primarily about us. It's about those that come next. We need to understand that this has been going on for far, far too long, and it falls to us to do something about it. Um, that's all I got. when we're done, and uh, maybe all of us will be back up on the stage when we're done and we can answer any questions that might come over the line or, or might come uh, from the audience. Thank you very much for your time.
get a majority in the legislature, we can direct that government to do what we want. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. So, a little bit about myself. I started off in the United Conservative Party, uh, Wild Rose first. Uh, I was very enthusiastic, like Todd, when Kenny came to the province. So I thought, hey, we've got one of our own. We've got a reform guy. Canadian Taxpayer Federation, he's solid, you know, he's going to come here, he's going to get Alberta back on track, he's really going to, he's really going to kick them at it, we're going to get this done. What I started to find inside the party, though, was compromises were being made in terms of ethics. So it's like, oh, we talk about diversity, and we, we don't support diversity, but we need to have certain kinds of people represented in caucus. So, all of a sudden it's okay to tinker with nominations in the name of a diversity. And then it's also okay to tinker with nominations because, well, the leader wants somebody in cabinet, a friend of his from the East, say, who's going to be energy minister, hypothetically. So it's okay to determine the outcome of nominations. And when you, when you go to, within the party and you talk about these kind of things, what you're told is, Rick, you got to be a team player. you got to let this go. Um, Rick, you start to cause a problem. Or the loser. Like, you're backing people in nominations that couldn't win. There's no room for you in this party. You, you gotta go. And so, what they did to me personally was they put me up on a code of conduct charge, and I had to go and defend myself at a hearing. And I brought my lawyer, and they had to admit they had no evidence, and they let me go. But then behind my back, oh, he's a sore loser. He doesn't fit in. He's not one of us. So, I started a new party. Derek Kildebrand, FCT, and we merged, obviously, FCT no longer exists with Wegvet. We are now the Wild Rose Independence Party, and this is why I mentioned faith earlier. Faith is important. Because in order to take on the establishment against Jason Kenney, you either have to have faith, or you're crazy. And I prefer faith to being crazy. So, thank you so much for everybody being here. Um, the way that we're going to win obviously, is to have everybody buy membership, donate in the party, set up CAs, uh, have candidates, fund and do different things. But there's a bigger enemy. Because, uh, right now it's the Freedom Conservative, or the Wild Rose Independence Party CA. Sorry. Uh, we're actually looking at setting up a new website. Paul Hinman's got a really good website we're going to be rolling out hopefully really soon. The Wild Rose Independence Party. Ca. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's. Ca. There's one last thing I wanted to talk about because there's one bigger enemy than Jason Kenney. And there's more important things than uh, me having sour grapes or unicorns or like I've been labeled. Um, and that's the myth of Canada. So this is what we're fighting. There's this myth, and I grew up in Ontario, so I can speak to this, that Canada is somehow this great country that everybody lives in, and we're all equal, we all have the same voice. And anybody who's lived any length like of time out here in Alberta can tell you that it's just not true. If you differ from the majority in any way, the establishment comes down on you. They crush you. I've had friends that have come to me and argued with me, and say, Rick, if you do this, you break my heart. If you, if you indulge in separatism, because people have died for this country. And don't you care about the past? Don't you care about all the things that Canada is or was? And I said, frankly, that's the past. The past doesn't put jobs on the table. Nostalgia doesn't feed people. Frankly, tears don't keep a country together. And it pains me to say it, but we all need to come together and we all need to fight for Alberta. We all need to support Paul Hinman, our interim leader. And I hope, I hope that you'll share my faith that we can get this all done together. We can build a new Alberta. We can get this done. And the forces that stand against us can't stop us if we all work together. Any questions?